It's really my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce Robert Bradway, the Chief Executive Officer and Chair of the Board of Amgen, as our next speaker. I want to start with a few words about Amgen and then about Bob. Amgen is one of the most admired pharmaceutical companies on the Fortune's list, year in and year out, and is widely regarded as one of the world's leading and most innovative biotech companies. The company was founded in 1980 as Applied Molecular Genetics and became publicly traded under its current name in 1983. For more than 30 years, Amgen has been a pioneer in the biotech space, successfully navigating that very competitive environment and becoming, as of yesterday anyway, a $122 billion market cap company with offices and manufacturing sites around the world, including right here in Cambridge. Amgen has a commitment to unlocking the potential of human biology to address serious illness through innovative human therapeutics. As chair of the board of Massachusetts General Hospital, as Chris said, I'm particularly aware of one of Amgen's blockbuster drugs, Enbro, which those golfers among us have often seen fondly mentioned by Phil Mickelson. As many of you know, Enbro started with work done in MGH's own Department of Molecular Biology. Robert Bradway, Bob, came to Amgen in 2006 as VP of Operations Strategy after years at Morgan Stanley, culminating in leading that investment bank's European corporate finance and banking areas headquartered in London. He has served in major positions at Amgen, including COO and CFO, and was appointed to his current position as chairman and CEO in 2013. He majored in biology at Amherst and has his MBA from Harvard, a perfect educational background to address the leadership and scientific challenges of the biotech world. One thing that strikes a reader of Amgen's annual report and its proxy material is the commitment of the company not just to success, but to doing things in the right way. Bob has been a leader in shaping the Amgen culture of compliance and business ethics, and himself chairs the senior committee on compliance within the company. Bob has a deep interest in solving the mysteries of cancer, how to discover its origins and to treat it. He has been recently named uh, the chairman of the CEO Roundtable on Cancer, a nonprofit group of executives nationwide focused on cancer therapy and treatment. Anyway, um, I'm just so pleased that Bob is here today. He will be speaking with Caroline Chin, uh, an experienced uh, healthcare and business reporter uh, from Bloomberg Business. Without further ado, Robert Bradway. <laughs> I know how this works. Great. Well, Bob, it's great to be here with you today. And before we get started, I just wanted to let the audience know that there is an iPad I have here where I should be able to get questions from you guys if you want to send them in. And the links should be appearing on the screens throughout our talk. So Bob, thanks for taking the time to be here today. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, and you know, since you've become CEO, you've had the opportunity to shape Amgen's strategy, and, and recently you set out six therapeutic areas that Amgen will focus on, of which one was oncology. So maybe let's start there. Um, you know, there's so many companies in the space working on cancer right now. Where does Amgen really want to stake its flag? What are the areas that you want to own within the cancer space? Great. Well, thanks for that question, Caroline. Uh, as you point out, uh, oncology is an important area for Amgen. It has been historically, and it remains that uh, today. So uh, oncology is one of our six areas of therapeutic focus, and we have a rich history in the field of oncology dating back to our early work with supportive care uh, projects. And 
I saw recently one of the analysts reported that we have about 10% of the worldwide uh, market for uh, cancer drugs. So we're a large player uh, in the market, uh, and we remain committed to the products that uh, established our legacy in the field. Those include Nulasta, Nupogen, Aranesp, Exgeva, medicines uh, of, of that uh, variety, as well as uh, therapeutic oncology opportunities. So when we talk about staking our uh, future or where, are we, where do we plan to invest for the future in oncology, we're excited in particular about multiple myeloma where we think our medicine Coprolis has an important role to play in the backbone of uh, therapy for, for patients suffering from multiple myeloma. And we expect to remain a major uh, player in the field of hematologic uh, oncology in particular. We have a number of innovative programs uh, in that field, which I hope we'll have a chance to talk about this morning. And, and of course, we're also very interested uh, in the emerging area of immuno-oncology, where we have two drugs that have recently been approved uh, to treat patients suffering from specific types of cancer. So it's an exciting time for us as a company and for the field in general, and we expect oncology to remain a big part of what we do. So you just mentioned a lot of things, but before we dive into specific drugs that you have, how about the flip side? Are there areas in oncology that you won't touch that is just not for Amgen? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, focus, uh, focus is important, uh, and it's important within a therapeutic area like oncology. And so uh, we have um, uh, been very disciplined about identifying the areas within oncology where we will focus and discriminating uh, against the areas where we've decided we probably don't have um, where we're not going to focus, where we're not going to allocate resources. So for example, whereas signal transduction was an important part of our research for a period of time, we're pretty much uh, dialing down our efforts in signal transduction, focusing instead on, for example, our bispecific T-cell engaging antibody platform, focused instead on immuno-oncology agents. And, and there are other areas around the stroma of tumors, for example, where we're not particularly going to invest resources. So we are, within our business, very clear about where we want to allocate resources, where we want to help uh, blaze new trails, and, and, and the areas that we want to avoid as well. Got it. So, so to stick on the high-level strategy first, you guys have a number of different ways of accessing external innovation, whether that's through acquisition like the Onyx deal or through partnerships like your collaboration with Kite Pharma. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach deals? When do you partner? When do you acquire? Do you have a preference? How do these deals come together? Sure. Well, maybe starting at a high altitude, uh, external innovation is core to what we do. Uh, if you look at our pipeline through time, through history, about half of the molecules that we've successfully advanced through the registration process and been able to uh, use to treat patients were generated internally and, and half externally. Uh, so that means we have to be uh, active looking for opportunities outside our own research and development organization, especially in cancer, where we looked literally at hundreds of opportunities last year. So we're active with our venture investment portfolio. We have a small venture group that invests in early stage innovative opportunities. And we're active licensing, for example. We uh, structured a creative research uh, partnership with MD Anderson looking at our BITE platform uh, in the setting of myelodysplastic syndrome and recently announced a collaboration with USC. So we're, we do both early stage licensing as well as later stage uh, licensing. And in the immuno-oncology area, uh, we struck a licensing arrangement with Kite that we're excited mm -hmm. about in the CAR-T area. We also licensed in some interesting uh, uh, bispecific opportunities with Zencore. Uh, and so licensing is a core part of what we, we do, both early and later stage. Uh, and then finally, we also look at acquisitions. And we've made several in the recent past uh, in oncology, the most recent uh, being Onyx, but in addition to Onyx, which brought us our leading multiple myeloma therapy uh, called Caprolis. In addition, we also acquired um, a company called BioVex, which brought to us an innovative oncolytic vaccine, mm -hmm. which is registered and approved as uh, Imligic, uh, and uh, acquired Micromet, which brought us our, uh, our first bispecific T-cell engaging antibody called Blincyto for patients suffering from acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So we're uh, active throughout the business development spectrum, and we have a, a very dedicated uh, group of professionals who, as I said, reviewed literally hundreds of opportunities for us last year. Now, when we're successful at finding something we like, uh, you know, obviously the, the external innovation competes with our internal resources, and we try to allocate resources to the most promising of the two, whether it's internal or external. And our, our focus is to find medicines that are truly innovative, 
uh, where we have a reason to believe in the biology behind the medicine and where we believe the effect size of the medicine can be quite large. And so those are some of our guiding principles when we come to look at external innovation. Got it. And, and as for partnering versus acquiring versus you know, going the venture route, how do you decide what is the level that's appropriate for your company? How much is it that Amgen has a plan versus it coming out of conversations that you have, say, with a biotech, where you come to an agreement on what's best for you both? Well, our, our, our focus has to be, as we think about allocating capital or resources to external collaboration, our focus has to be on how we can earn a return from that uh, capital, how we can earn a return from the collaboration. And uh, where we think we can earn a return through a licensing structure, we're very happy to pursue licensing. Uh, where we think we need to have complete control over a program, then we'll consider an acquisition. But you know, the, the, the bar is high because uh, you know, acquisitions travel with uh, a premium being paid to one set of shareholders, and we need to be disciplined to make sure that our shareholders can earn a return from that capital as well. So we look at, at, at both, but it, it tends to revolve around the question of whether we need to control the whole program or whether we can do it collaboratively with another entity. Great. So let's dive a little bit into your oncology pipeline um, and the drugs that you already have approved, starting maybe with Kyprola since we were just talking about the Onyx acquisition. So you've steadily expanded the label for that drug um, since uh, acquiring it and getting it first approved. Can you talk a little bit about what, where you see it fitting in? Um, I think you've talked about it as a potential backbone therapy mm -hmm. um, and where you're going to take Kyprolis next. Yeah, well, we're excited about Kyprolis because of the data that we've generated in phase three clinical trials of the medicine in patients that are suffering from multiple myeloma. And so the data that we generated in a series of phase three trials that we reported last year were very impressive, um, leading us to grow in confidence that both proteasome inhibition has an important role to play for patients suffering from this disease, but also leading us to grow in confidence that Kyprolis is a superior agent uh, for uh, maintaining uh, patients uh, while undergoing therapy for, uh, for this disease. So uh, again, based on the data we've generated, we're very optimistic about the role uh, that Caprola should play and very optimistic about the importance of uh, proteasome inhibition for these patients over the long term. And can you just get people up to speed on the data that you have seen? Because you've done some really interesting head-to-head -head trials on that drug. Right, so we have generated data from a head-to-head -head trial in particular against a competing proteasome inhibitor, which demonstrated the attractive profile of, of Caprolis against that agent, as well as uh, assessing Caprolis uh, with other important leading multiple myeloma drugs. And again, in both uh, phase three trials, we demonstrated results that were far superior uh, to the control arm of the trials. So the good news is, that this is an agent that looks to have a very large effect size and one that op, uh, offers, we think, real promise and hope for patients suffering from this disease. And we continue to look at uh, 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 you know, other innovative ways of helping to manage these patients, including, for example, with our bispecific programs and uh, considering bispecific programs from others as well, which was behind the decision that we made to license um, a program from Zencore. Yeah, so let's talk about that. You've had um, your first biospecific approved, Blincito. So can we talk a little bit about where you see biospecifics fitting in in the medicine cabinet of, of cancer drugs? Will they be used by themselves in combination? Um, and what are the biospecifics that you are working on that are currently in your pipeline? Well, maybe we should start the focus on our first approved uh, molecule, our first bispecific uh, program, which as I said earlier, was approved for patients suffering from relapsed refractory uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And this is a molecule known as Blincito. Uh, again, it is bispecific, so it uh, engages the T cells as well as recognizes an antigen on, uh, on the uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia cells. Uh, and so it is uh, an immuno-oncology agent able to bring the body's T cells to bear in the fight against uh, this very difficult, challenging disease. So we think with Blincito, we have a therapy that's not just useful for patients who are at a very difficult stage of, of their disease process with ALL, but also a proof of principle that we hope to translate and have become a proof in practice for other, uh, in particular, hematologic malignancies. So we're exploring this uh, approach in uh, AML as well, uh, another form of leukemia. We're also 
uh, excited about the data that we have in NHL uh, with this approach, this bispecific approach in particular uh, with Blincido. And so we think that this approach may have wide, uh, widespread applicability uh, and naturally we're looking at this in combination with other agents including the, the checkpoint uh, molecules as well. So uh, in general as a standalone for hematologic malignancies we're excited. We're uh, interested to, to test it in combination with uh, other immuno-oncology agents, and we have a very large suite of programs underway looking at the potential efficacy of this approach in solid tumors as well. Earlier stage there still, uh, but we're anxious to see some data uh, so we can begin talking about the relevance of bispecifics in that setting. In multiple myeloma, there are a few targets that are of interest to us, and so we're looking both at our own uh, bispecific programs to see, our own bite platform, to see whether and how it may be applicable in the fight against multiple myeloma, but also uh, a program at Zencor attracted our attention and was one of the primary motivations for us to do a licensing deal with them. Great. Another, you've had so many recently approved drugs. The other one I wanted to talk about was Imligic, uh, which is the first oncolytic virus therapy to be approved by the FDA. So can you talk a little bit about that and, and the trials that you are now testing that in, in combination as well? Sure, and as you mentioned, Caroline, we had six drugs approved last year, but four of those were in oncology, uh, and we include uh, Caprolis because we had a significant uh, approval for an expanded range of, of patients suffering from multiple myeloma. But in addition to that, Blincido, as you mentioned, Imligic, and, and if we have a moment, I can talk about um, our OnPro product as well uh, for Nulasta. But Imligic is the, is the first of its kind, the first ever um, a molecule of its kind approved. It's an, an oncolytic, uh, uh, virus used and approved to treat metastatic uh, melanoma. So we've taken a, a herpes simplex virus, uh, engineered it, inserted a GMCSF gene, and demonstrated in clinical trials that uh, we can achieve durable response for patients whose uh, metastatic melanoma is non-resectable. Uh, and so on the basis of the data that we generated, FDA and other regulators have approved this agent. Uh, and so we're excited about it for the for the you know, relatively small number of patients that it's approved for now, it represents real innovation, and we're excited about the data that have been generated in those patients. But very importantly, uh, we're excited about the possibility of, of, of combining this with other immuno-oncology agents. And so we're running a, a variety now of clinical trials uh, looking to assess this molecule in combination with the PD-1 molecules, PDL one CTLA-4, and so the, you know, if you'll forgive me for a moment, if the, the idea of perhaps priming the immune system with a molecule like Imligic uh, and then being able to uh, use one of the checkpoint inhibitors to sort of unleash the immune system on the cancer is an intriguing idea that we're exploring in clinical trials. Great. Yeah, the, the, the other uh, partnership that you mentioned earlier was the one with Kite. So, I think we've had a lot of interest and attention being paid on T-cell therapies lately, and we've seen, obviously, some really encouraging and promising results. I think on the flip side, there have been some questions about uh, manufacturing and scaling and how to turn it from a very exciting process into sort of a commercial product. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you think T-cell therapies are right now um, and how what you see as a path forward to bring them to become a commercial product. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we're still uh, excited about the partnership that we entered into with Kite. We're excited about the prospect for CAR-Ts, but we recognize it is indeed still early days. Uh, and I think you know, in, in settings where we have, for example, an off-the-shelf molecule like Blincido available uh, for patients suffering from ALL, uh, you know, that is attractive to us. I know that CAR-Ts may uh, offer an important therapy there as well over time, but I think some of the logistical issues that you outlined in your question, Caroline, are ones that need to be worked through before we see widespread uh, applicability of, of the CAR-Ts in the clinical setting. But no question, it, it remains an attractive, exciting area, and it's an area that continues to uh, receive a lot of capital investment uh, from within the, uh, within the industry, for sure. Great. So one other thing that you've said recently, I think this is in the last earnings call, you mentioned that now that you guys have digested the Honest Acquisition and launched six products, that Amgen's back in a place where you are able to consider bigger deals again. Um, you said something that along the lines of the aperture is opening for this to be something you can look at. So I'm curious to hear what's on your wish list. Or are there, you know, in oncology or in other areas, where do you see opportunities to build Amgen's pipeline? And are there any technologies or therapy that 
you wish existed that you would love to see out there? Yeah, well, I think uh, what we were trying to reflect was that after a period of time of focusing on earlier stage licensing and earlier stage uh, molecule acquisition, that we feel we're at a stage now where we can embrace larger scale business development, larger scale licensing or, or acquisitions. And the starting place for us in oncology and across all of our other five therapeutic areas is uh, a need to believe in the biology, a uh, need to believe that we're looking at an innovative medicine that can make a big difference for patients. So belief in the biology, the potential for the effect size, and the ability to develop uh, a molecule that provides real value to society. And I think you know, one of the issues that, that we have to take responsibility for and have to be serious about in our industry is the need to advance innovation that has a large enough effect size to make sense for society. Innovation, as, as everyone in this room I think appreciates, uh, is a challenge and it's an expensive challenge. Uh, and so uh, what we need to be capable of doing is, is advancing medicines that are both innovative uh, but generate enough benefit for society that it makes sense for us as a community to be investing in those medicines. And, and that's what we're trying to do in cancer and indeed across the rest of our portfolio as well. Got it. So speaking of innovation, I think one topic that's come up quite a lot at this forum and, and in general has been drug pricing um, and how to assess what the value is of a medication. So do you think that cancer drugs are priced appropriately now? Um, and how is Amgen working to sort of balance payers' concerns with the need to reward innovation? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right. It's a, clearly a very topical issue, and I think that reflects a few things. But one of the important things that it reflects is, is the successful uh, progress of innovation in the research and development labs across the industry. So the good news is we're generating innovative medicines that appear to have a large effect and, and uh, appear to be needed by society and by patients suffering, for example, from cancer. The bad news is that in order to earn a return on that innovation, they come at a price uh, that's creating some important trade-offs to have to be uh, wrestled with uh, in the healthcare system. So our view, you know, we, we think that um, to the extent that medicines are priced with a value basis, so that there's a, an appropriate value equation that we can demonstrate uh, to payers that, that, uh, that you know, innovation is appropriately rewarded in oncology. You know, in, in most markets around the world, uh, there is a process through which the value of medicines is obsessed using a variety of different objective measures for doing that, and that doesn't really exist yet here in the United States. There really aren't agreed uh, frameworks that enable us to have a discussion on a level playing field about the value of one company's innovation to the healthcare system. But again, value-based pricing of medicines means we need to compare the, the value that's generated for the healthcare system or for society um, by taking the medicine as opposed to uh, uh, having to deal with the care in a different, more expensive setting. And can you talk about what sort of frameworks you would like to see in place um, to, to help us assess this value? Or are there ways that Amgen is structuring the studies you're doing um, or gathering data to help payers see this value right now? Well, I think we and, and others in the industry ha do and have for some time been assembling the data necessary to help payers, particularly in single payer states, evaluate you know, all of Europe, for example, evaluate the value uh, of, of our medicines. And so we do collect the data, and I think we have a responsibility of sharing that data with payers around the world, including uh, here in the United States, and, and, and we try to do that transparently, uh, and we will continue to do that. I think in terms of innovation, uh, you know, one of the things that caught the attention of some in the medical community as well as in the media was the decision we made at the time of launching Imligic. Again, our medicine I talked about earlier, which is our uh, oncolytic therapy for patients suffering from metastatic melanoma. Uh, and when we launched that drug, we said we would work with providers and payers to uh, keep an average cost of therapy therapy for Enlogic at $65,000. And so, you know, that occasioned some remarks in the media uh, because it was an innovative approach to try to manage the potential exposure uh, of payers and, and healthcare institutions to the cost of treating this disease with yet another exciting new innovative medicine. Great. Um, so as was previously mentioned, you're also now the chairman of the CEO Roundtable on Cancer. And one of the things that uh, the group is doing is it's established a data sharing platform called Project Data Sphere. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that's about and also just how you managed to get all the companies to work together to collaborate and share their data from their trials? Yeah, sure. 
Well, Project Datasphere uh, is an initiative that uh, was started in 2014, arising out of uh, the CEO Roundtable on Cancer, which Kathy described earlier, which is a, an initiative that President George H.W. Bush started in 2001, uh, where he encouraged chief executives to get active on behalf of their uh, staff, employees, uh, to develop better cancer prevention, detection, and, and, and treatment. And one of the in initiatives that arose from that was this notion of the Project Datasphere, which is um, a, uh, a curated, uh, publicly available data set. Uh, we now have 30,000 patients from the control arms of cancer trials uh, available in a format that enables researchers essentially to use the data as a digital laboratory. And so we've had now in excess of 1,200 scientists using these data uh, from 45 countries, and the data have been ac accessed thousands of times, and are available in a structure and with a suite of analytics made available generously through uh, our friends at SAS, who are very supportive of the CEO Roundtable on Cancer, uh, so that you know, physicians and scientists can interrogate uh, the performance of control arms in cancer trials. And, what, curiously, industry has been very quick to support this and to upload de-identified patient data from the control arms, and uh, the academic community has been rather slow to uh, adopt this, and so we're working hard to encourage the academic community uh, and the NCI and other uh, uh, groups uh, to explore, consider, and take action uh, about putting control arm uh, patient data on this data set. Um, it may, over time, as the data set grows, be a way of achieving improved efficiency in the process of doing cancer drug development. So the more data that we have there, the greater the prospect of making that a reality. And can you explain how that would work? So how would, would that allow you, in theory, potentially to to have your control arm be based off the data set, and, and so are you saying that trials will potentially be smaller? Well, let's go one step at a time. But in the, the first part of your question, in what we would like and, and what, what uh, the leaders of Project Datasphere have discussed with regulators, for example, at FDA, is that notion that uh, when we have a sufficient data there in a robust enough way, uh, that we may be able to think differently about running two-arm or multi-arm uh, cancer drug development trials. So uh, that would be the, the hope, that we may be able to, to rethink the paradigm for drug development in cancer if we have enough of that relevant data available to give regulators confidence that that's the appropriate thing to do. Got it. And one more question on this. You said you have data from 30,000 patients now. Mm -hmm. what, what size do you think that it would have to reach for, for that vision to start to be attainable, or do you have a goal for the number of patients you'd like? Well, we certainly have a goal for this year. <clears throat> the goal for Project Datasphere is to have 100,000 patient lives uh, available uh, in the digital lab by the end of the year, and, and I'm optimistic that we can achieve that. I think focus like that, which is being put on uh, cancer by the uh, pres or Vice President Biden's Moonshot Initiative, uh, gives us an opportunity to talk to government and to the academic community and, and to our peers in industry about supporting an initiative like that. We don't, need to, we don't need to reinvent this wheel. This wheel exists already today in a robust fashion that's available to scientists around the world. And, and what we need to do now is recruit more and more data uh, to make it available through uh, the initiative, the Project Datasphere Initiative. Great. So just a couple more questions um, based on the time we have here. What do you think about the state of funding overall for cancer innovation? And is there enough? Where, where do you think the money could be coming from more? We've seen various different types of commitment, obviously, from the government with the Moonshot program. We've seen individuals like Sean Parker, who's given generously to also increase research funding. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether or not cancer research is well-funded enough right now, and where else we could see funding coming from. Well-funded enough, that's a great question. I think, look, the, the big picture is that um, we are an aging society, and cancer is a disease of, of the elderly, and, and we have an economic issue in this country, which is the burden of the diseases of the elderly, and cancer is clearly one of them. And so, you know, is society investing enough in the prevention and the treatment of, of cancer? You know, I, I think we're, we have not reached the point of diminishing returns. I think there continue to be significant opportunities to invest in 
uh, improvements in cancer therapy, cancer prevention. So uh, I don't think that uh, as a society we're investing enough. Now, uh, industry is investing heavily. I think we're seeing an extraordinary amount of attention and resource being devoted in particular to immuno-oncology uh, in the field. I think there are something like you know, 30 targets now that are being explored across literally uh, hundreds of clinical trials. I think in excess now of 250 uh, clinical trials and uh, up to two dozen different indications. So there's an extraordinary amount of, of attention, for example, being focused just in that narrow area of cancer research. And I think that reflects what an exciting time uh, this is in the field. Uh, I, obviously, I'm concerned, as are others, about the waning federal support for basic research in particular, uh, and concerned about the struggles that NIH uh, is having uh, to receive the kind of funding that I think is appropriate at this stage in the life cycle of, uh, in particular, uh, biology. You know, we're still at a very early stage in the life cycle of uh, the discipline of biology, and I think the returns to investment in basic research, translational research and development are going to be very attractive over the next several decades. And I think the government in particular has a role to play in funding the basic research. Mm -hmm. Not so much, in my opinion, on the translational and certainly not on the development side. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there's an opportunity. And um, you know, I hope that uh, when we have a, uh, get through the election process that there'll be an opportunity to focus attention on the need to continue to support basic research. Because I think what this community that we're assembled with here reflects is an incredible ecosystem in this country that works incredibly well and brings together government, academic, uh, contributors and industry contributors uh, to make progress against the big serious issues that we face uh, as a society and, and that clearly includes the, the burden of cancer on this society. Great. I want to just jump quickly here to a question from the audience who wanted to see where, where do you see the, f the cancer field migrating? Well I think you know again we are very interested in, in the area of immuno-oncology as I said we have two agents that are already approved and on the market uh, and are being explored in a variety of important uh, clinical trials looking at combinations across the immuno-oncology field, so we're very excited about that. We have a few other clinical stage molecules that we're uh, excited about. Uh, so I think there's clearly a migration to this idea that has been intriguing for so long that if we could find ways to unleash the immune system on cancer, we might be able to achieve a real paradigm shift and, and with it a, a real step function change in the quality of care that patients receive. So we're excited about that and I think we're also watching with, uh, with wa watching very closely uh, what the uh, uh, genetic, uh, you know, the ability to sequence uh, cancers uh, will unleash on the field and in particular, you know, watching liquid biopsy, cell-free DNA, technologies like that evolve to see whether we might be able to move closer and closer to what we've, what we've all been longing for, which is the notion of personalized medicine in cancer. On the topic of liquid biopsies, do you think that an early detection screening test is a possibility that we'll see in the next decade? Well, again, you're asking a layperson, but you're asking a layperson who sees right. a lot of capital being allocated in the field, and there's certainly a lot of smart capital being allocated to that idea. I'm intrigued by it. Uh, I'm impressed by you know, the, the progress that we as a society are making, as a society are making in our ability to, to use the tools that enable us to sequence uh, genomes and, and including cancer genomes. So I'm pretty optimistic about what's in prospect there, but that's probably a question better directed at one of your scientific uh, panels. Sounds good. So the last question for you, just um, to, to, to round up our discussion here. At the forum so far, I feel like I've heard a lot of optimism. Um, including from your own head of R&D, uh, Sean Harper, who, who said yesterday, we can start to think about the word cure. Mm. Um, s do you agree with him? Um, and I'm I always agree with him, my head of research and development, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts overall on how we've come, how far we've come as a field. Um, do you think this enthusiasm is warranted? And also, are there any areas you think we might be getting a little ahead of our skis where there might be a bit of hype? Well, you know, um, anytime you see the, the amount of capital moving as quickly as it is at the moment into the, you know, the realm of immuno-oncology, I think um, is a capital allocator, you know, that raises a bit of a red flag. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, focus and resource right now being deployed against some of the early ideas arising in the immuno-oncology field. So, you know, I think we'll look back over the 
uh, you know, with the benefit of time, we'll be able to look back and see there were some very smart investments, but we probably are pursuing some blind alleys as well. But that's just the unfortunate reality of trying to advance science. You know, if we knew we had the roadmap in advance, it would be much easier, but we don't. And so, uh, you know, the good news is I think we're, we're justifiably excited about changes in the field, justifiably excited about the benefits that we see accruing to patients. And, you know, in our own case, it's very exciting for us as a company to see some of the patients, including pediatric patients who were treated in the early days of Blincido and to, to see these patients continuing to do well with the disease that they were told uh, was an end of the road disease for them. And so, um, you know, we're, we're, it's those stories that excite us and I think excite uh, anyone who's engaged in the battle against cancer. And, and we're having more and more of those at the moment to, to celebrate and to talk about. So I'd rather focus on what's happening that's exciting and there's quite a lot of that. Uh, and we'll worry about, you know, where we made mistakes when we have the benefit of hindsight to figure that out. But uh, this is genuinely a very, very exciting time in the field and I'm, I'm sure that you're, the, the guests here are picking that up from the various sessions that they're, that they're participating in. Well, great. Thanks so much for your time, Bob. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Thank you.